I was uh, born in Laurel, Maryland. I was the first son of what's now a fairly large family. My father was in the United States Navy. And uh, so when, after I was born, very soon after, I lived for about four years in the Canal Zone in Panama. So I had a little bit of experience of uh, nature while I was there, a little bit of a wildlife for a young child because I was able to go into the jungles and that sort of thing. So I developed a very strong interest in nature at that time. And then we came back to the United States and uh, when I came back to the United States, I went into the normal public schools until about the age of uh, 14. At the age of 11, I, did, I had decided that I wanted to become a priest. So, and, uh, so I went into a seminary for about three years outside of, uh, Pennsylvania, outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So I spent a, a number of years there, and it gave me a chance to sort of focus my mind, get a little bit more concentrated. There was a lot of discipline involved in that, uh, that experience. And then after that, uh, I went to a public school for a certain period of time and uh, was involved primarily in, in uh, dramatic, dramatic uh, plays, doing dramatic plays in, in high school, and also part of the, the football team, the high school football team and so forth. And uh, I used to throw javelin. I was a javelin thrower. So then I went to university at the University of Rhode Island which is a state university, and studied uh, English and American literature with a fair amount of uh, physics and other sciences uh, thrown in. So at the, uh, the school there, I was uh, interested in a lot of Eastern thought. I mean, this is the time in the United States when the hippies were running around, people were you know, enjoying themselves and uh, so forth, and I became quite interested in uh, Zen thought and also in uh, Indian thought. And after uh, coming out of the university, I felt, uh, well, you know, what, what am I going to do in my life? You know, I have this, uh, this science background and so forth. And uh, I was in the university library one time looking at uh, a globe of the world. And for some reason, I had an intuition. There was a spot in the Northwest Territories of Canada that I thought uh, maybe I should visit. But it was unmarked. It was white. There were no towns listed there. So I, I took off on this journey, went to... Uh, to Edmonton, Canada, eventually ended up in Edmonton, worked at the University of Alberta as a, a chief archaeological researcher on a, on a very large dig, the largest dig in Canadian history in the Cypress Hills between Saskatchewan and Alberta. So while I was working there and getting a, getting a little bit of money together for this next venture, I ran into another fellow who was a, he had been in, a, in Israel and uh, he was interested in, in going up north with me. So we purchased a canoe, and uh, we paddled down the Mackenzie River about uh, seven, eight hundred miles, you know, and uh, eventually ended up in a, a town uh, called Fort Good Hope. It was an Indian village. Before that, we didn't even know that there were Indians living up there. That's how ignorant we were of the, uh, the location. So, of course, the, the American Indians didn't particularly like us too much because we were white people, and uh, they had bad experiences with white people in the past. But uh, after playing some baseball with them and so forth, with the kids, uh, they kind of took us in. So what happened was that fall time, uh, I had an offer to go out and to live in the bush, live in a traditional nomadic life with one Indian uh, trapper. And my friend said, that's enough for me. It's too cold here in the, the wintertime, and I don't want to get involved in that. So he left. He went south. And I went out in the bush, and I lived for a little over two years uh, out in the... Uh, in the Northwest Territories, a nomadic life, a hunting and trapping life with the, uh, with the Indians there. And uh, for me, that was a very, a very important experience in my life because it, it taught me a lot of things about myself. It taught me a lot about human nature. It taught me a lot about discipline and uh, perseverance. And uh, also, I enjoyed, once again, being out in nature, pristine nature. So after this, uh, this experience, I contacted my friend again and said, uh, guess what? I've had another in intuition. He said, oh, now what? I said, we're going to Japan. We're going to be riding around in Rolls Royces, and uh, you're going to be involved in some sort of business there, and things are going to be great. He says, well, what are we going to do there? I said, we're also going to study martial arts. Now, he had studied a little bit of martial arts before. Uh, I think it was uh, Shitoryu, uh, Japanese karate. And uh, so we decided to go to Japan on a bit of a lark, and uh, we ended up in, in uh, Tokyo, went over to the school of uh, Gogen Yamaguchi, the cat. And uh, we noticed that they had a pretty rough, uh, 
schedule there for, for training people in Goju Karate and uh, decided we didn't quite like Tokyo and I had a feeling that we should go to Kyoto. Of course we didn't know anything about Japan and in those days uh, the Japanese didn't speak very much English so I had to learn Japanese in about a week to be able to, so that we could eat and, and, and travel around. Anyway we ended up uh, studying Goju Karate at the Seibukan Academy in, uh, in Kyoto. I studied there for, uh, for a little while but I didn't find the, uh, at least at that time, the people that I was working, I didn't find them very, very challenging in terms of their, their abilities in the ring, so to speak. And uh, so I took on uh, another style. I started uh, studying Shorenji Kempo. Studied Shorenji Kempo in Japan, and uh, that I went all the way to, uh, to Black Belt. And uh, that was quite an interesting uh, experience for me because I had a, a chance to learn more about Zen Buddhism at the same time learn about uh, the martial arts and it was a more sophisticated style I felt because it involved not only just the you know, strikes and, uh, and kicks but it involved locks and throws and, uh, and uh, a little bit more thought mind control. So studied Shorenji Kempo and then uh, I was, my friend we actually did we started off very very poor in Japan but we ran into an American who, who had been there since 1950 after the, the Korean War and uh, he was a very, very wealthy individual. He was the one who coined the name Panasonic for Machusta, Machusta Electric. So he was pretty well connected in Japan. And his uh, private hobby was to collect Rolls Royces and Bentleys. So we had a pretty good uh, life, you know, working uh, in association with him. He acted as a consultant for Americans in Japan. So my friend decided to stay in Japan. I wanted to continue my studies of martial arts, so I went to Taiwan. And uh, when I arrived in Taiwan, uh, I met a friend there by the name of Larry, Larry Tan, who is now uh, teaching uh, martial arts in New York City. And uh, Larry befriended me, took care of me, and, uh, and at one time he came up to me and said, hey, how would you like to come watch some uh, Americans uh, shooting a film there? So anyway, I got involved in a film called Bruce Lee's Secret. Bruce Lee's Secret? And uh, that was my first film in, uh, in Taiwan. Hong Jing Lee, he put me on a pretty rigorous uh, training program. What we used to do, I'd get up at about 4.35 in the morning, go over to where he was staying in his apartment, wake him up, you know, we'd go downstairs, have a little bit of doujang, uh, which is uh, like a, uh, a dofu sort of milk, and uh, we'd go upstairs to the top of this uh, rather tall apartment building and practice on the roof. And uh, one of the things that he told me that I should never ever do is never kick a, a, a heavy bag, never kick anything. And I said, why never kick anything? What he had me do is he had me get up on top of the building and face the sky. He said, okay, I want you to pick a point in the sky and I want you to sidekick that point 20 times and I will tell you whether you've made it or not, whether you're kicking in the same position. Of course, the first time you, you kick, you may hit the point, but the second time you can't because your mind has been jarred, your body has moved position, you don't know where that point is anymore. But you try to remember and you try to keep focused. So that was extremely uh, difficult. And we'd have to do it again and again and again and again with all different types of kicks. Never allowed to, to kick anything. And I thought that was kind of strange. Uh, I said, how can you learn distancing? How can you learn timing? And all that sort of thing. He says, don't worry, it'll take care of itself. But then what I realized, the theory behind that, one of his theories is that Nothing, no human being can move as fast as the mind can move. If you have that kind of focus, that kind of ability to, to hit something that the mind is focusing on very, very quickly, that's very, very high speed. That will increase your speed and also your distancing because it's much more difficult to pick an abstract point in your mind than it is to see another body moving, you know, where you've got really something to, to focus on. And I found out much later on that his theory was correct that uh, I didn't have to kick a heavy bag or any of, the, any of this sort of thing. He had developed a very, very special internal system for doing uh, Taekwondo that was different from anybody else in the Taekwondo world. And it had a lot to do with, uh, with uh, circular movement, angular momentum, the style or the internal uh, uh, motion inside the body that you don't recognize readily that's able to deliver this type of, uh, this type of motion. So, Anyway, we continued uh, uh, practicing, working together, and when we came to Hong Kong, we continued that, and we went to one of the beaches. We, uh, by this time, uh, I think uh, 
uh, Huang Gamsan. Huang Gamsan uh, joined us. Uh, he wanted to learn Taekwondo. We used to get up early, drive out uh, either by motorcycle or car, out to one of the beaches where the sand is very, very thick, and do our kicks and uh, in movements in deep sand. And the reason uh, he'd have us do it in deep sand is it would build up the, the leg muscles and the balance. So you'd be able to jump higher, you know, uh, develop more power, coordination, and, and so forth. It's very difficult to move, you know, in deep sand. Well, that was another one of his, uh, his training techniques. And uh, he said that all of this was only a small portion of the type of training that they used to do in Korea. So anyway, later on, uh, I was able to, to take uh, Huang Zhenli's internal system and develop it into a videotape called The Art of High Impact Kicking, where I think about 700 different kicks would come out of eight basic kicks. But uh, his theory, there's a lot more, of course, to Huang Zhenli's theory, but I found that in all the people that I've met in the Taekwondo world, Huang Jinli's uh, system and his method of delivery is not only scientific, but it's a, uh, and very, very profound, but probably the most efficient form of Taekwondo that I've ever met or ever experienced. And that's why he, one of the reasons why he was very, very good in uh, films. And he was, he was so coordinated that he was able to pick up the Chinese Gong Fu move, movements and also adapt them, adapt uh, Taekwondo or the power hitting uh, technique of the of Korean tai, uh, Taekwondo into Chinese Gong Fu, which is, which is a whole other thing, how he managed to do that. People would look at his motion and say, wow, your motion is really, really good. But he had combined Chinese Gong Fu with Taekwondo, and he'd also combined uh, his understanding of camera work, knowing if you've got a, a medium shot or you've got a long shot, what type of movements you know, uh, choreograph the best. You know, depending on the, the, the particular lens and the camera. So he was very, very aware of the camera as well. And even though the director didn't have to, the director didn't have to tell him anything, he just knew exactly what had to be done. A lot of times, he was even organizing the actors, you know, sort of angling the actors and compensating for the actors uh, themselves so that we'd get a much better shot. I got a call from NG, and he says, uh, we don't want you to come back to Hong Kong right away, seeing that you're in Europe. We'd like you to do a little bit of location scouting. And I said, uh, location scouting for what? He says, this is a new film, and uh, there may be a part in it for you. And I said, well, what are you looking for? And so he described a number of things that he wanted me to, to look for down in, uh, in outside of Rome. Uh, one was uh, lions, working with lions. Uh, another was a, a particular, a very, very big guy a big guy who's a, like a world champion type of martial artist that uh, they could do a fight scene. And uh, also to look for, for large villas like castles or, or, or something like that. So when I was in, in Rome, I had a chance to, to speak with uh, uh, one of the top lion tiger trainers in, in, in Italy called Guglielmo. And uh, he took me out into the countryside where they were filming some lions. And uh, I asked him a question. I said, Guglielmo, what is the possibility of getting a top martial artist to, to do a fight scene with a lion? And he looked at me, he smiled, he says, I'll show you what the possibility is. So he said, please stand here in front of this chicken wire, pretend that you're a martial artist going to fight with this lion. And uh, he says, I'll take care of the rest. So what he did was he threw a big chunk of meat at my feet, and he had a guy with a bar behind me. And this lion was about 30 feet away, crouched down, thumped its tail three times, and wham, came at me so fast that I was, it's the first time I've ever had that experience because the chicken wire is very, very thin. And he said, what do you think? And I said, hmm, difficult. You know, the person has to be really high speed, has to move very high speed. He said, also, they need big heart, <laughs> you know. And uh, he showed me what big heart mean because he opened up his chest and his chest was completely torn apart had been completely torn apart. His heart had been opened up by a, by a lion attacking him from behind. So I went, hmm, maybe not such a good idea trying to do a, a, a fight scene with a lion. Also, uh, I was able to access an 11th century castle, a very, very uh, beautiful castle on top of a hill outside of Italy. Uh, outside of uh, Rome, and uh, also I managed to to meet some guys that were that were world champions or, or European champions or country champions uh, that uh, do different type of martial arts. 
So I was able to pick up a number of these things, and I thought this next film was probably going to be shot, you know, in Italy somewhere. But uh, when I arrived back in Hong Kong, you know, and discussed this, and I showed photographs of the different locations and uh, what I achieved in that, there was some discussion. And then I guess somehow they changed the story, whatever the original concept was. And then uh, NG came to me and says, I had a, have a part for you in this film. What it is is we're taking footage of the game of death. Although the game of death part one had already been done, they were going to take footage of the, uh, the game of death and do another film called The Tower of Death. And I said, well, how are you going to manage that? Well, we're going to use a fellow by the name of Kim Tae Jong, another Korean Bruce Lee uh, lookalike. And, uh, and I said, well, how are you going to do that? Well, he said, well, we'll shoot him to the side, or we'll, we'll use back shots or whatever to give the audience the illusion that, uh, that it's actually Bruce Lee. But I think he had a little bit of difficulty with the amount of footage, actual real footage of Bruce Lee that was available. But he took whatever was there and tried to, to put this uh, fil film together. And the first, uh, first time that, that I went and actually worked on the film was in Tokyo. So we worked in Tokyo, we did some shooting in Tokyo, and, uh, and then all, after that we went, to, uh, we went to Korea. Well, the, uh, the fight scene, of course, we were out near, uh, near a graveyard, graveyard area, and uh, I was supposed to fight these, uh, these two Koreans and, uh, using, using tiger style. So, I mean, the fight was going, uh, going pretty well, and uh, until, well, the other thing I have to say is during the fight, we weren't alone. It wasn't just the crew alone. The, the Korean military, a contingent of Korean military were there. I would say they're anywhere from 30 to 50 soldiers that were out on maneuvers, and they happened to be sitting around uh, watching this, uh, this thing happen. And then uh, we got about... I would say 70 percent, 65, 70 percent through the, through the fight scene. And uh, I had to do a reverse spinning kick to the shorter of the, of the Wu brothers. And uh, I told him, I said, be very, very careful. I tried to get a translator to tell him, be very, very careful with this. Don't rush in too close because this is a, this is a difficult kick to stop. And uh, I guess he got excited and uh, whatnot. He rushed in a little bit too close. And I came across, I could see myself, my foot going right into his face, and I changed it from a heel strike, pulled back a little bit, and hit him with the, the ball of my feet, like that, in his face. And uh, he went out. He went out like a light. And uh, so he was knocked out on the ground, and it took uh, quite a number of minutes to, to revive him. And of course, we hear, could hear comments in Koreans, uh, from the Korean soldiers, oh, Taekwondo, Taekwondo, you know? <laughs> this is using Taekwondo. And uh, so anyway, the guy was a little bit freaked out after that. I mean, anybody that gets hit hard in a, in a fight scene, it disorients, it disorients you, it, it upsets your timing. And, uh, and also, it's, I mean, it's, it's a bit unnerving if you get hit pretty hard. Quite a number of years later, I would say it was 19... About 1994, 1993, 1994, something like that, I was uh, distributing movies in, in Korea, and I happened to be in Seoul, and uh, we were meeting new, new distributors. Actually, at that time, it was more on the, on the video market. You know? And uh, we were meeting these uh, particular distributors, and this company, the representative of the company that came out was one of the Wu brothers, was the guy that I knocked out. You know, I looked at him. He had put on a little bit of weight. He looked at me, and there was a little bit of an uncomfortable silence there for a while. <laughs> he says, uh, I know you. <laughs> and I said, I'm sure you do. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, we had a bit, of a, a bit of a conversation. It was a little bit of a stilted co business conversation, because I think he still had in his mind <laughs> that, that experience. We didn't end up doing business together, but uh, at least we knew that we were still more or less related to each other film-wise. My death scene in the, the Tower of Death, uh, it was in a Golden Harvest studio, and I was supposed to lie down in the bed, and they were going to take the, uh, the ninja-type stuntman uh, in the film, and he was going to put a hemp rope around my neck and stuff a cloth in my mouth. Well, the first thing that happened is he put it around my neck and, and pulled, pulled the noose uh, tight. And when he pulled the noose tight, 
it gave me this horrific uh, rope burn on my neck. That was take one, but he didn't get it right. So he had to do it again, another rope burn on top. I think it took four to six takes before uh, he was able to get that right. All right, so <laughs> my neck is, uh, is pretty painful. Anyway, the next, the next few shots is he had to throw the rope, the rope over a beam, and as he pulled on the, the hemp rope, they had me rigged with a wire, and uh, I, was, I was pulled up, pulled up. Well, the guy had to be able to hold the, the, the hemp rope fairly firm, and uh, the, the wire had to hold. Well, later on, they found out that the wire had, uh, had a fault in it. It was very, very uh, close to, uh, to, to breaking. So had the, the wire broken, you know, while he was doing that, that rope would have snapped my neck, probably would have snapped my neck. So it was, uh, I think, since then, you know, Hong Kong people have gotten really, really good with their wire work. <laughs>